All right, continuing in our topic 10 on uh, motor skills, the next subtopic here is on, <laughs> I had to watch that, reaction time and response time. Not the same thing, not synonyms for each other. These are two distinct durations that we're going to measure and we're gonna have a meaningful uh, uh, understanding of. Okay, so first of all, I'm sure uh, this isn't, uh, 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 completely brand new news to, to any of you, um, but uh, people don't think and move instantaneously. Um, we have a speed limit uh, by which our subsystems can communicate, our sensory system, our motor neuron system, uh, and that is the speed of transmission and, or sorry, transduction which is transforming the physical energies of the universe into a neural signal and transmission of that signal uh, over neural networks. And so if you're interested in this topic, um, we talk about a lot more uh, you know, in the aspects of, 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 of what it means to have neural activity uh, in ISEN 635, Human Information Processing. One of my favorite classes is classes to teach. And so you want to learn more about that, that's a great class to do so. Uh, for now, realize that anytime there is a need for a neuron to fire, and this might be related to thinking about something, calculating something, sensing something, or performing some sort of action, there is a time delay. There is, there is the consideration of how long it takes that signal to travel um, along that neural network. So I need a volunteer from the audience for this next experiment. I happen to have one here, my lovely assistant. Uh, and so uh, this, this assistant, uh, I'm going to hold up this crisp, clean $1 bill. Okay. Okay. And all you got to do is put your hands just like in this picture here, one on either side. You can't touch it okay. until I drop the bill. Okay. And as soon as I drop the bill, if you can close your hand to catch it, as soon as I drop it, it's yours. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> good try, good try. How about one more, folks, from the audience? Yeah, we'll give it one more try. All right, so put it right at George, and then as soon as I drop it, you can grab. You ready? Yeah. Oh, oh sweetie. All <laughs> right, very good. Well, here's your consolation prize so thanks for you all right okay so had i done this in a live class environment um very likely uh well some of you would have tried to game the system a little bit but this is a very difficult activity to perform and even though you know you may really really want that dollar bill the speed of your visual system and your motor neuron system is working against you here. So here's what's going on. All right. So it takes roughly now 200 milliseconds is a simplification. I'm mostly just trying to give you a range here to be thinking about a fifth of one second. 0 0.2 seconds is 200 milliseconds. Okay. So here's my assistant, and she sees that dollar, and she, you know, she's building up expectation. When am I going to drop it? Uh, and you know, so that she can make a move. Uh, but what happens is there's some movement. Okay. It takes about 150 milliseconds. I'm going to break down, break this down here in a, in a slide a little bit later for your eyes to pick up that something has changed to interpret that imagery and to reconstruct, well, basically reconstruct it and interpret it in the visual cortex. It's been about 150 milliseconds already. Okay. Um, now, oh, the dollar's dropping. Now my motor cortex, so visual cortex back here, my motor, my, when I keep saying we're gonna load the motor program and execute it, here's where we're loading it, okay? Here's where we get most of the neural activity around various motor um, actions. So that takes some time too. I just talk over the awesome animation. And oop, by the time the signal gets there, if you can watch the fingers, you know, they're just a little too late. It took me a long time to animate, so I want to make sure I showed it just right. Um, okay, so this is a very common thing. If you want to, you know, try this at home with kids or your significant other, <laughs> see if they can catch the one dollar bill. Um, all right, so fundamental 
speed limit. There is lag in the human control display system, just like we talked about, you know, control lag with my Raspberry Pi uh, video game system. The human display and control input system is also facing these inherent delays. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to start studying what are the nature of these timelines because the way that humans respond in time are going to define a lot of things about our world. Um, I've talked earlier about things like what, how do you set the speed limit, you know, for this particular roadway, for example, um, that comes down to, well, how long does it take a human to visually, you know, acknowledge something, recognize something? Um, we know how big it has to be, but how long does it take now, right? Um, so actually, it's both, right? So I have to be close enough so that I get my threshold of recognition. But now how much time is it going to take for me to visually you know, recognize what that thing is, then think about what I do, then think about, you know, choose what I'm going to do and begin to act on it. Okay. So we're going to break this down step by step. We're going to start talking about mathematical models in the next, um, in the next uh, section here, um, or a couple sections. Uh, and then uh, you, you'll have a chance to kind of break these down. But first, we need to start and, and, and separate, you know, these two concepts that I already said are going to be you know, not, they're not the same thing. They're not interchangeable. Very commonly in casual language, reaction time or response time are just two words that start with an R that mean how fast can you do something, okay? In our world, these are more precise. Reaction time is a subset of response time, okay? All right, so reaction time is how long it takes my sense my sensory system to register what's going on and i have the very first observable moment in time in which uh, my response activity is observable okay so if i you know if you say all right if if this one letter pops up on the screen then i got to hit the space bar okay well as soon as that letter pops up and i think space bar my action, my action is space bar, and I go like this. I've already given enough, you know, I've already had enough um, a neural activity to say that was a reaction. I reacted to it. I haven't pressed the button yet, right? So I go all the way down, I press the space bar button. Now when that registers, you can say I've responded, okay? So the reaction is that moment right after the sensory system um, well, after you perceived what's going on, processed it deeply enough to decide what you're going to do in response, and just initiated that response. Okay, so that's our reaction time. Okay, so between the stimulus presentation and the very first measurable activity. So the way that this could be measured in terms of the precision we're talking about here, and this this has been measured experimentally, um, it might be I'm looking at neural signals. So I'm actually looking at you know, this region right here, again, the, the motor cortex um, and heightened activity right there is going to precede heightened activity in any of my motor, uh, gross motor movement, okay? So if I intend to do something like slap a button, my brain is going to show activity intending that motion before my hand actually starts to move. So I may be able to get the signal there, Maybe I can get it in the, you know, the change of, um, you know, uh, electrical activity at the muscles, although you would argue that that's already after the brain has sent the signal and it's transduced down to my, or it's, it's transmitted down to, you know, that motor, um, or that, that motor group. Um, eye tracking is another one too. So each of these are not really the exact pinpoint on the atomic scale in time at somebody's reaction but they're closer than a gross motor movement like press a button. They're closer to that moment right after there's a decision about what needs to be done. Um, the eyes being one of the more expressive um, uh, sort of information sources to, to changes in neural activity and also being that close to that neural activity means it's got a shorter distance, shorter neural distance to travel. So it's one of the fastest 
uh, responsive, um, you know, sorts of ind indices of, of the human about to do something. All right, so, so far reaction time, it's this, we know it exists, measuring it in a precise way, that's the big question, that's the problem. Now response time, um, so hey, how long did it take you to press that button? Well, that's response time, but that's not, you know, that's me deciding to press the button and then the amount of time it takes to reach for contact and depress the button. And so there's an aspect of movement time that comes after my reaction that we have to consider when we say response time. Now, response time matters because let's say I'm driving a car um, and there is a need to slam on the brakes. Well, I don't get credit for intending to slam on the brakes. <laughs> I get credit when I have activated that control. So my response time to the brakes is typically that, that's the, the, the measure we're interested in for safety reasons. Um, but it's interesting to study that reaction time because if we could make the movement to activate the brakes simpler, faster, for example, then we may have this whole ability to respond could be faster. Okay, so just as another example, um, just to kind of break this down and map out how we're going to start talking about these different um, durations of time. So this, there's a stimulus presentation. Let's say that's you driving and the car immediately in front of you, you see the red brake lights come on. So that, that's the stimulus, boom, they're on right there, okay? Now there's an amount of time during which your visual system takes in this pattern of light, um, you know, it deconstructs it, reassembles it in the visual cortex. Um, you interpret that, hey, there's been a ch change. What is that change? Oh, it's these lights. What do these lights mean? Oh, it means this car is breaking. So you've thought through this far. This is how much cognitive work has gone, gone on. And you then think, okay, well, what do I do if that car is breaking? I'm going to I ultimately decide, here's all my possible courses of action. I'm going to choose the best course of action here for me is to step on the brake. Uh, so I have now initiated the motor program, step on brake, okay? But as soon as my foot is lifted, as soon as it begins to lift off of, let's say I'm, it, it was currently on the throttle, as soon as it begins to lift off of that, we would say that right there, is our reaction time. So the earliest possible note, you know, this earliest possible um, observable measurable moment in which there was, um, you know, a, um, um, yeah, a, a response movement is observable. All right, now I gotta move my foot all the way over to the brake and press the brake. And this is an amount of time. Also, we're gonna call movement time. Now, take a pause here, I don't have my, soundboard set up, but imagine I just went ring, um, because each of these two things, reaction time and movement time, and now I've color coded them. So unless you're, you know, deuteranomalous, um, you can see that they're red and green. <laughs> if not, you can just read that they're different reaction time, movement time. Um, but these are going to be where we start talking mathematical models, because there are um, mathematical models that will describe human reaction time, and there are models that will describe human movement time. Um, but ultimately for this, we got to remember that when you put those two together, that's our response time. So the time from when the brake lights are, are in initiated until the brake is depressed and the vehicle can, you know, the vehicle can, can slow down. Um, that's the response time. That's the, the, the critical duration that we have to think about for a lot of, you know, humans interfacing in systems safety aspects. Oh, very good. Okay, so I promised I like to tease this as, you know, one of the things we can analyze in this topic. Um, so, um, you know, I'm a bit of a sports fan. I don't know that baseball has always been, you know, at the top of my fanhood, but, uh, you know, when, when the years uh, where I live close to a group that's doing well, I'm a baseball fan. Uh, Justin Verlander, uh, um, I, I think he's been uh, traded even again since since the Astros, but he, uh, when I was a grad student in Michigan, he was a, a, a the star pitcher for the Detroit Tigers. 
and I love the Tigers and my infant son loved the Tigers. So we were big fans of Verlander, still am. Uh, and then he came to the Astros, so he was close by and I, I could keep being his fan. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the noteworthy things about Justin Verlander and other major league pitchers is how incredibly fast they can make a ball travel from the pitcher's mound to the home plate. Okay, so, you know, you don't have to know the ins and outs of baseball to know the, I'm, I'm sure most people know the essence is the pitcher here is standing on a mound in the middle of the infield, you know, the middle of this diamond shaped thing. The batter is standing at the bottom and the ball gets delivered incredibly fast. And this, you know, the batter has a chance to potentially, potentially hit the ball. Oh, so this is 60.5 feet. Now, I'm just going to use that raw number here for what I'm going to show you next. Um, because I think technically you can see how far he's stretching. So if it's this plate to that plate, that's 60.5 feet. But what I'm interested in is when he releases the ball to the plate. So let's just say it's still 60.5 feet, realizing that's, a, that's, that's on the long end. It's likely a, a little bit shorter than that. All right, well, turns out Verlander can whip the ball at 104 miles an hour. And I've seen it. I mean, I've been watching games where he's hit that. It's incredibly fast. It is remarkably fast. It is borderline world record. Nobody has ever thrown a ball this fast, at least a baseball, right? Uh, so it's, it's an incredible feat to be able to do this. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why pitchers at the major league who can throw that hard are incredibly valuable. So let's do a little bit of... Um, Break down here, um, you know, now that we're talking about human reaction time, I think this really sets the stage for how I like to think about this challenge. And ultimately, can we break it down and, and determine, hey, are there aspects of Verlander's game where if he can throw it this fast, what else could he do to basically make it almost impossible for this hitter to successfully contact the ball, you know, except for by blind chance, like close my eyes and just randomly swing. So if there's any sort of, I'm going to try to react to the pitch with enough time for me to swing accurately, good luck. Okay, so here we go. 104 miles an hour traveling 60.5 feet takes about 400 milliseconds. Okay, 0 0.4 seconds. This is our time window of information for which this batter, this is Derek Jeter, by the way, if, if you're a baseball fan and you've been screaming Jeter, right? So um, makes so I can refer to Jeter and Verlander, right? Okay, so Jeter the batter here, he's, uh, he's got 400 milliseconds to watch this incoming pitch and look how fast it goes, 104 miles an hour. Um, he's, he's got a chance to pick up shortly after it's released from Verlander's hand. He should have all the information he needs to decide, number one, do I swing or not? And number two, where do I swing? Or what do I do, right? Um, those are two decisions potentially, right? And those have to happen in sequence. And he's got 400 milliseconds to do that, right? Uh, so let's see, let's see how this breaks down. All right. So I went to, um, I love this website, howstuffworks.com and they have a nice breakdown on the physics of baseball if you want to read more about this. So here's the, here's the link at the bottom. Um, but all these data seem to match up with what I've been seeing in the text. So I'm going to, I'm going to cite this website, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's good stuff. Um, so it takes about 75 milliseconds, 0 0.075 seconds for the batter's eye, for, for the ball to be physically in a location with light reflecting off of it and it reaches the retina. Okay, from this point, it takes about 75 milliseconds before there is a meaningful visual representation perceived by this batter, okay? Um, and that breaks down to roughly 25 milliseconds of processing on the retina, 20 milliseconds of transmission to the visual cortex, 30 milliseconds of reassembling, reconstructing, um, this this visual image. Okay, so about seventy five milliseconds later, Jeter has an image <laughs> that he can potentially you know do something with. All right, so now he knows about where the ball is seventy five milliseconds after 
it's it's traveled 75 milliseconds closer too, by the way, right? So if there's a moment in time where light reflects off and strikes the retina, it gets 75 milliseconds closer by the time that visual experience registers, okay? So now Jeter's thinking, all right, good. So I've got enough information because I'm a professional baseball player and I can recognize that this is the kind of pitch I want to swing at, okay? He's got 50 milliseconds to come up with that with that conclusion, or roughly, this is about the fastest it could take to say, I'm gonna consider at least two options and I'm gonna go with option A. Uh, and now I'm gonna activate that. So it takes 50 milliseconds to do that much decision. So I'm calling this thinking time, okay? And I give it a nice, you know, it's a nice, <laughs> nice slangy term only because then when I bring it up again, you'll know what I'm talking about. But this is all the deliberation, this is consideration of all the possible courses of action, and I'm going to select this one. This gets a lot more complicated if you only, you know, in Jeter's case, he, he maybe only has a few courses of action. Swing, don't swing. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's only those two courses of action that he's thinking about. So when you have fewer things that you could possibly do, it's faster. When there are more things you can consider, this number quickly gets a lot larger. And that's that's for the next subtopic where we talk about how that happens. <clears throat> okay, well, so far, it's taken 75 milliseconds for our eyes to give us an image, 50 milliseconds for me to decide swing or not. And let's say, yeah, it's, it's swinging time. So it's gonna now take 25 milliseconds of transmission from my motor cortex down to all of the coordinated muscles that have to now start, you know, activating, have to start contracting, right? Uh, and if I'm a really finely tuned athlete and I've done this motor action 50,000 times, I think that's a reasonable estimation here. Well, then I can maybe complete this in a compact way in 150 milliseconds, I can get the bat from up here down to the contact point, okay. So if you believe me that this is something that these have to happen in serial, in sequence, right? It's, I can't, I can't have my brain be, be processing the imagery and begin, you know, and well, actually that is what happens is they begin the swing even before they have enough visual imagery to determine if they're going to complete it, right? So that's where you see the, the check swing sort of thing. So this is, that, this is that gray line between open loop and closed loop. You know, you have to get some of it going, otherwise there's just no, you don't have enough time to complete a swing. Um, but yeah, in any case, for the most part, this series happens one thing after another. So they add up and we end up with Jeter's reaction time. So I just summed those up 75 minutes, to, 75 milliseconds to get the imagery, 50 milliseconds to decide what to do, 25 to send the message to my motor, my, my motor muscles. 150 milliseconds to move. So that's my movement time. So this says, all right, Jeter, as soon as your eyes register a pitch, <laughs> as soon as your eyes give you enough light that you have an experience um, that could, you know, that could, that could basically help you uh, uh, de determine if you're going to swing or not, the very fastest you can possibly get from that point to a swing is 300 milliseconds. And Verlander is giving you 400. So, okay, well, that makes it possible. That makes it possible. I can, I can see some of the ball and begin to swing. But keep in mind also, you have to make this decision while the ball is at least 300 milliseconds away, okay? Because that's how long it's going to take to get here, right? So 300 milliseconds, here's, by the time the ball gets right here, 15 feet away from Verlander, Jeter has to have made the decision or he has, this is the moment. This is go, no go. This is at this point, you get no more chance to deliberate. It is all serial processing now in order to pull off this hit. So what does he get? About a hundred milliseconds of time to visually sample what's going on with this ball. And that over this amount of time, 100 milliseconds, is essentially the gap, the leeway that he, that he has to wait 
get the most up-to-date information about where the ball is going to be uh, before decide, you know, before initiating this whole swing process. And as it turns out, 100 milliseconds is about what an eye blink does for you. <laughs> so, you know, how fast is that? It's that fast. Uh, so if Jeter blinks right at the release point, good luck. Right. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this, you know, breaking down the complexities of baseball at the highest level, at the peak of human performance. And we still have these hard speed limits, basically, to deal with in all of our thinking and, and, and moving sorts of activities. <clears throat> okay. Now, okay, so as I alluded uh, uh, earlier, if there are only one or, two, you know, well, if there's one course of action, okay, um, if ball is here, then swing. Otherwise, don't, okay? Um, if you can frame it that way. I, I don't know that a baseball player, they, they may think I'm making a conscious decision to swing or I'm making a conscious decision to not swing, which would be two courses of action. But let's say you're, you know, you see brake lights come on and there's only one thing you do, it's step on the brake, okay? So we call this a simple reaction time or a simple response time. So in the, in the case of reaction time, again, this is the very first instance at which you can observe any sort of initiation of activity. Um, when there's only one course of action, we call it simple reaction time, also simple response time if you, when you do step on the brake. But the key here is one course of action, and it's just if this, then that. Choice reaction time involves thinking time. <laughs> so I told you that would come up again. Um, so simple reaction time, it might be, hey, as soon as this light comes on, press this button, and I can just be sitting there ready and light on button, light on button. And that's gonna be my simple response time, response because I pressed the button, you know, if that's what's being recorded. But now if I add to that, okay, if this light comes on, press this button. If this light, if this other light comes on, press this other button. If this other light comes on, press this third button. And so the more choices I have, the more potential outcomes and potential related courses of action there might be, that takes up more processing time. So it still takes me, once I decide I'm going to hit button B, it still takes me the same amount of time, simple re response time, um, as simple response time, but I, it takes me an additional amount of time before that to calculate, to think through and be like, B is the one I'm going to hit, okay? So I've still got my simple reaction or my simple response time for pushing that button, but additionally, the time to think about is it, which of these buttons am I going to push? All right, so a couple of things that affect this. So first of all, the stimulus modality. This is a very interesting one. Vision compared to audition compared to tactile. You may know, you may notice that vision, uh, even in the optimal conditions, 150 milliseconds. Remember, seven, that, 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 that's pretty much what we saw with Jeter here, isn't it? 150, 75 plus 50 plus 25, right? Right there. So yeah, so uh, right. So 150 milliseconds in optimal conditions, and it takes a little bit longer if you don't have this ideal, you know, optimal visual experience, right? And notice that audition and tactile are faster. So representative uh, reaction times to these stimuli can be faster. And if you think about it, and I've experimentally seen this, you have a light come on and press a button versus a sound come on and press a button. The sound is gonna, is gonna trigger you faster uh, or the tactile signal, right? So um, it's a little bit of a trick. There's, there's a few games that I play with my kids like, like um, you know, press the button as fast as you can. And if you can find a way to tune into your auditory as opposed to visual uh, uh, stimuli to, to trigger your response, you can be faster. Um, the, Little trick there for if there's any video games, I'll say Mario Party is a good one where there's a lot better like who can be the fastest to press the button. See if you can tune into some of your non-visual senses and you can cut them off by 40 milliseconds. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, the intensity of the stimulus also matters. So as, um, as the uh, intensity 
uh, grows, uh, the response time, the reaction time is typically faster. Um, so, and, and part of this is because if you think of, I need to um, react to a particular stimulus, you have to recognize that stimulus. And when you have a more intense stimulus, there's a faster recognition because if you think of it like the light striking the retina, when there's more light striking, it's kind of a faster processing. That's kind of how I think of it. Like you're gathering sensory evidence and that evidence can come in faster when it's more intense. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, and then also reaction time is faster if you have expectations, you know, that are influencing, you know, um, your, your, your readiness to respond. Um, so, uh, you know, when you expect something, you're faster. When you don't expect something, you're slower. And this, you know, comes into play in baseball again. And I know this might sting some of, some of us who, were, um, who are Astros fans. Um, but, you know, they had this scandal a few years ago uh, in the World Series where they were, maybe you don't know this, uh, I don't know that this is common knowledge or anything, especially if you haven't been in, in, in Texas the last few years, uh, but there was a scandal in which the Astros batters, so not Verlander, the pitcher, but the batters, the Jeter side, right? So um, they were getting, you know, secret coded information that was, you can see this is the catcher here. And he's signaling with the two fingers there which what what type of pitch the pitcher should throw in there. Well, if a player for the batter's team is sitting way out in the you know in the in you know far side of the field with some binoculars and can watch this catcher and say, oh, it's going to be a curveball. The two means a curveball. And if that message could be somehow sent to this batter, so the batter knows, hey, hey, hey he's going to pitch me something, but it's going to be a curveball. I have that additional expectation working for me. I should be able to react that much faster when I am confirmed that yes, that ball is indeed a curveball, right? And I'm ready to swing at it. Um, so yeah, when there's expectation and those and the and reality matches that expectation, you will have basically a faster reaction. Okay. Um, factors affecting the choice reaction time. So again, this is where things get more interesting now when you have multiple choices, the numbers of them and the probabilities of them. So that, that kind of works with this too. If something is expected, I'm sort of saying the probability for this thing to come in is high. And you can then translate that to, if you've got multiple choices and you know 90% of the time it's this, but 10% it's this or 5% and you know there's all these other options. When the 90% likely thing happens, you're faster to acknowledge that because again, you're kind of tuned into the more likely outcome, right? Um, and we'll talk about mathematically how that breaks down in the next subtopic. Um, our ability to discriminate or discrimin discriminability of the stimuli, can I tell that that one's red and that one's green, um, you know, for example, so I don't get confused among them, that will keep my times down. Um, SR, stimulus response compatibility, um, this ties back to the controls lecture um, when we talk about, um, you know, uh, for example, when I give this sort of a control input, does my expectation of the change in the system match? Is it a compatible change in the system to the uh, change in the control input? Um, and so, yeah, you know, compatible or incompatible, this would make, you know, the choice reaction time longer. If, for example, I've got a, B, you know, A, B, C, D uh, uh, lights going left to right across my screen, but I've got A, B, C, D going right to left in buttons and I have to match them up, you know, something kind of like this, it's gonna take me a little bit longer in my reaction, not just in my response or in my, I'm gonna hit that A button on the left. It's gonna take me a little bit longer to make that reaction, you know, that very first initiation of any movement is actually delayed in addition to potentially I have to reach further so my movement may, may be further delayed. But yes, yeah, so, so even before, like right as the very first instance of my motion is, is, is observable, it will take longer to get to that point if, there are, if there's a more complicated process to determine what I need to do in, you know, in my action. Okay, uh, with practice, you can reinforce this. So we can learn, for example, 
you know, this, this different mapping. A good example of this for the video game world is, um, you know, forgive me if you're not a video game player, but one of the things I, I get mixed up on frequently is the inverted X and Y axis. So if I want to, if I want my character to look up, you know, some games would have you press up on the, on a control stick and some games would have you press down on a control stick, like you're pulling back, like in an airplane. And for me, I'm, I'm a pullback type. I'm an inverted control stick all the way. When a game puts it the other way, I am, I am really, I'm, I'm really suffering. And it, but eventually if I practice enough, I can break that, you know, original linkage of the inverted and I can learn to interpret the new way. It's hard though, right? And it certainly takes me longer and it slows down my entire, you know, my entire game. Um, I think we gave this example in the controls lecture, so I'll just refer you back to that. But again, remember, if you are you know, driving a remote control car and you want that thing to turn around and come back towards you, think about the control input that might be needed for this sort of a control and think about the control input for what be, might be needed in this sort of a control and which one of them maybe maintains more consistent compatibility across all of the you know, possible orientations. And I believe we'll leave you at that one there. Yep, this is that example again. So you turn it that way, the vehicle tends to follow the, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise direction of, of, the, of the controller turn, the vehicle tends to follow that same sort of pattern. All right, that's it for this subtopic.